Welcome. It's so nice to be with you all this afternoon. My name is Alex Petrella and I work with Education Evolving. I have the honor of being one of the planning partners for this event. On behalf of the Bush Foundation and its planning team, thank you for being with us today. We've been on this journey for over a month and I want to thank you all for being with us and working with us to build this movement together to create a student-centered movement for equity in our schools and in our communities. This is our final workshop of this event. We will have a closing session on Wednesday um, from 9 to 11 and you can see more about that on the website. I'll post that information in a bit. Uh, we are together today for a wonderful session the power, politics, and preservation of heritage language. We are so excited to release this paper today for you all. This is a project that is close to my heart as a heritage language speaker myself and as one of the authors of this paper. Today, we will hear from my amazing co-authors and a few of the educators and leaders who helped to shape this paper. At this moment, as we live through the double pandemic of COVID and the racial inequalities, the urgency around this work is amplified. We as adults need to work to ensure that our students are able to bring their whole selves to school. I'm looking forward to learning from and with you all today. Before we get started, we have a few community norms to share to ensure that we create a positive and safe space for our time together. Please listen to understand, not to respond. Keep an open mind, assume you can learn from everyone in the room, consider different points of view and experiences, be respectful and kind, use positive language, be conscious to step up and to step back so that all who wish to contribute can do so. And please keep in mind that this conversation is being recorded. Thank you again for being with us today. Just a couple of quick tips. Um, if you notice right now in the chat, it looks like folks are starting to talk and that's wonderful. Um, please be sure to change right now. The preference is set to chat only to the panelists. Uh, we'd love you to switch that to panelists and attendees if you can figure that out so we can all be a part of the conversation. It looks like many of you have already started to do so, but if you can, please introduce yourselves. We want to know who's here today and please continue to use that chat feature throughout the conversation. Another thing that we're going to ask you to do is to please use that Q&A feature. You'll see that along the bottom line of your screen there. And in doing that, you'll be able to post questions for our presenters and our panelists. And now I'll turn the conversation over to our two lead panelists, Danica Leonard at Education Evolving and Kai Yang Yang at Cal. Thank you so much. Okay, well, good morning, good morning, or afternoon rather. <laughs> you can tell where my head's at. All right, I'm going to start with my, with sharing. And one second. While Danika is doing that, I'll just quickly introduce myself to give her some time. My name is Gaying Yang, and I'm the Director of Programs and Partnerships for the Coalition of Asian Americans. Uh, we also go by CAL. Um, our acronym is CAAL. CAL is a network of multi-sector, uh, multi-ethnic, and multi-generational leaders who actively harness our collective power to improve the lives of community in Minnesota. Towards this mission, CAL connects leaders, creates spaces for learning such as this, and builds powerful community-centered agendas on the shared priorities of education, which is one of the topics that we've been working on for many years, economics, and this year we added immigration. Um, Cal Connects leaders, um, uh, like I said before, we believe that anyone who is advocating for an issue that's important to the community is a leader. It's not just positional power uh, or titles. Um, and so, as you know, we have many leaders in our community. Um, uh, we, we believe that our diversity is our asset and that building cohesion, cohesion and unity among and across communities to be powerful ensures our multiracial and multicultural democracy works for its entire people. And I've been very honored to be working with Alex, Danica, and Lars at Education Evolving on this project, uh, but really just uh, especially to the two ladies who've been writing this paper uh, day and night for the last few months. So I am so honored and I, I'm so happy to have Danika present the paper to you and then we'll go to the panelists 
uh, discussion and then we'll end around four o'clock. So we'll have some opportunities for all of you to ask some questions and to make some comments as well too. So I wanna throw this back to Danika. All right, well, thank you, Kaying. Um, so uh, as I said, I'm Danika Leonard. I'm the policy director for Education Evolving. And just to give a reminder about what Ed Evolving is, um, Ed Evolving looks to advance student-centered learning for all students by supporting teachers, um, and designing and leading schools and by advocating for a policy that is open um, to innovation. And so we are going to talk about a, a paper that we did in partnership, like Kaying said, around heritage languages. Let's get started. First, we want to make sure that we um, honor and acknowledge that we are on stolen land. This land is uh, Dakota and Anishinaabe land, um, and they are also pioneers in heritage language reclamation. And we look to them for their leadership and we stand in solidarity. So we introduced ourselves. These are our pictures in case you need them for later. Um, so as Kain said, these, this is what we'd like you to walk away with. We want you to walk away with the strength and commitment to support resource and resource heritage language reclamation. I'm going to spend about 10, 15 minutes to talk about um, our paper that we wrote around heritage languages and how it impacts student achievement. We'll have a panel and then we'll close to, with calls to action. And I want to just let you know that this is also an interactive panel an interactive webinar. We encourage you to share your comments in the chat. Um, we will have a Q&A session and we will work to moderate those comments um, as we see them. And, um, and also Alex Vitrella, the person who introduced, the, uh, introduced us is also a co-author on the paper. So Alex, I also invite you to make sure you share your perspectives on uh, the presentation and panel as well. Let's move forward. So I'd like to anchor us in thinking about our students. And this is um, a statement from um, a scholar, uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum. Um, and she talks about uh, what students see um, in terms of their identity and who, who they are and who people say they are. So just take about 10 seconds to think of one of the most awesome youth um, you know and think of how they might answer these questions. Now that you have that youth in your head, please make a mental note to check in with them uh, sometime this week. All right, let's get started. Heritage language. So heritage language basically means that um, it is your home language or it's a community language that's other than English in this country. We have an estimated of 142,000 Minnesota students who speak a primary language other than English. Um, and you can see the top five, uh, Spanish, Somali, Hmong, Karen, and Vietnamese. Um, and so, the, uh, so one thing that we learned is that students will learn the school language better if they abandon their heritage language. We learned that that was a complete myth. Um, we also learned that access to heritage language instruction makes uh, English easier for students to learn. But I want to be clear that heritage language reclamation is not about learning English better. Um, and that without access to heritage language instructions in school, um, students will lose their language in about two to three years. Heritage language promotes scholar success. And what it does is that it nourishes their sense of identity um, it strengthens the connection with families and communities to schools. Um, it promotes community involvement and it promotes a sense of student and community and family belonging. Also, um, there are studies that say that bilingual students are less likely to drop out of school than their English uh, only speaking immigrant peers. All right. So when we're thinking about heritage language, we want to talk about the benefits of multilingualism and how that compares to the 21st century workforce skills employers need. 
As you can tell, many of those uh, beneficial effects of being multilingual will translate into um, the workforce skills that employers say that they need and for our scholars to be, um, to be prepared for a global future. You can see things like executive function, um, cultural competency, flexible thinking, but you can also see it's important that um, as we become more diverse, that we are multilingual. There are some state and federal policies that support um, heritage language. The first one is the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, and it requires states to include progress towards English language proficiency um, in their school accountability systems. And Kayin, feel free to jump in um, if there's anything specific you'd like to add. The All Kids Account Act requires MDE to disaggregate data um, and to provide cross-tabulated data um, on the most populous intersecting groups. Anything you want to add, Kain? Um, I think for the All Kids Count Act is also, this is a, Minnesota is one of five states in the United States that have um, passed this law. And our goal is really to understand the diversity within the school districts. Right now, data often aggregates racial categories only. And so even when you look at the African American or black category, you will not see Somali, Liberians and others. So you don't see the multilingual and also multicultural, but also the immigration journey that brings people to this country. This is particularly true for Asian Americans. We are often aggregated as one group. And so then it perpetuates the model minority myth because you only see the, the, the most of uh, the highest performing and you don't see uh, the disparities within communities. And so this law uh, is now uh, in the books in the state of Minnesota. Uh, according to MDE, we should have about 120 uh, district, school districts that should be implementing this law. And we're hoping that if you are in a school district that is implementing it, you, you, you communicate it uh, well to, uh, to parents and so that they can start indicating that their child is not only Asian Americans, but they may be Karen, Hmong, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese or others. So this is a very important law that uh, has been passed here in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. And then uh, last but not least, the LEAPS Act. And um, it emphasizes and supports multilingualism and bilingualism. And it also establishes seals for world language proficiency. Um, it's, it's, it offers certificates upon graduation. Mm -hmm. And also it um, adds the acquisition of academic native language literacy um, and, to re and it's, report it's required to be reported in all Minnesota schools. And I think the challenge here is that even though we pass a lot of laws, if it's not implemented with fidelity, then, you know, there's more work to do, right? And so as, as we think about our call to action, we need to say that actually Minnesota is very progressive in the laws that we have passed, but that we also need to make sure that in practice and, in, um, and that we are actually uh, implementing these laws. And so uh, this is a perfect uh, space for us to have these kinds of conversation. So the point of this is really to say that we have the laws that will help us, but right now we need more advocacy from communities and leaders such as all of you here. Thank you. So let's talk about some of the challenges that um, face access to heritage language. And I wanna say we are breezing through the presentation part because the most important part of this uh, time together is really to have a panel discussion um, because we have some really valuable and brilliant panelists um, that will also share their perspectives. So I'll keep, I'll keep going. So um, in 2019, Cal hosted a heritage language summit and some of the challenges that we heard um, from educators around heritage language instruction included things like lack of materials. Um, teachers are building their uh, curriculums from scratch. It is time consuming and you are all, and teachers are also reaching out to other educators, other community members, elders to ensure that they are building a curriculum that really supports, um, that really supports student academic success, but also a, a rounded, uh, well-rounded understanding of their heritage language. Um, and there's also a, I called it a district assertion of ownership around curriculum. One of the barriers that teachers face is that um, some districts have uh, instructed teachers to not share their, in, their curriculum information. Um, and so the assertion that somehow districts can own and monetize it um, is, I put in the paper, untenable. 
Another thing is that the pathways to teach full teacher licensure are uh, limited to none. There are no teacher, pro teacher prep programs in uh, Minnesota for specifically heritage language instructions. And the portfolio process, unfortunately, um, with, the, with the teaching board or the teaching licensing board is time consuming and really complicated. And then also there are limited to no professional development opportunities for heritage language teachers. Other challenges include that the courses aren't respected or publicized and their in heritage language instruction is vulnerable when budgets when school budgets are cut. So are heritage language courses um, likely to follow and also these courses are seen as elective and not as uh, an opportunity to, to be required of someone's um, of graduation standards. The other thing um, that we learned was that just the model of Western education, it is in conflict directly with oral language traditions. Um, Hmong language, culture, and history were passed and traditions are passed down orally. And it wasn't until the 1950s when Christian missionaries and European colonizers started to write down um, and record, uh, record Hmong language, history, and culture. But we have to understand that 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 information in that context is limited by their own biases and own worldviews. So it's not a full rounded about and owned, fully owned by the Hmong community, um, some of those earlier texts. And then also it's at odd because in Western culture, um, things are only valid if they are written down. And so um, heritage language instruction, um, especially, especially Hmong language, um, can be in direct conflict with the normal model, normal model of learning in this country. Karen, is there anything you want to add? No, I think that's fantastic. And I, I the the reason that we have focused on uh, the Hmong language in this paper is because Minnesota is home to the second largest Hmong population in the United States. And then in East St. and St. Paul, we are probably the largest uh, Hmong population in urban setting in the world. And so for this reason, I think that we are leading the work in dual language immersion Hmong language programs, but there's so there's always a threat as Danika was saying about uh, lack of uh, investment and resources. And so even though it's a pioneering program, uh, we need more advocacy and uh, documentation to show that actually it is, uh, it is, it is growing uh, literacy within our community. Absolutely. So this is uh, something for um, everyone who will take the slides to read um, on their own time. But basically what we want to know, what we want to share is that um, access to heritage language, it builds relationships with the family and community and school. Um, and denying access to heritage language instruction and denying access to opportunities for students to build their identity um, will continue to perpetuate um, academic outcomes and dis disparities experienced by students of color. Next. So I, yeah, thank you, Danika, for that wonderful presentation. I think that we'll, we'll be uh, launching the, public, uh, the publication. I don't know if we're sharing the link today or not, but it will be on both our websites on Education Evolving as well as Cal. Um, and so I want to transition to the panelists a little bit, but I want to just kind of thank uh, uh, Danika, Danika and Alex for writing the paper. Uh, and like I said earlier, for really spending a lot of time doing the research as well too. Um, uh, the Asian American population in Minnesota represents about 5% of the total population. And uh, um, the Hmong community represents 31% of the whole Asian American population. Uh, and we are the largest here in the state of Minnesota, which is very different from California and, and the East Coast and the West Coast. And that's the reason why today all of our panelists are Hmong because all of them have um, been building the Hmong immersion programs in the school districts here. Uh, as well as we have a represent, re, representative from uh, Fresno. But to begin our, uh, our panelist discussion, I wanted to ask um, uh, my name, Bang, who is a, uh, and I, if, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna try to say, I'm gonna say all their names correctly because I hate it when we butcher our names for the sake of white supremacy. And so if you don't, if you cannot hear the Hmong, then you can look at their names there, but her name is Mining Wang. And she's going to do two very short poetry 
uh, poet, uh, po poetry that she's written herself. And she is a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she happens to be uh, uh, present at our Heritage Language event in 2019. And I, ha I met her at another event and have invited her to, to um, start, kick us off with this, uh, uh, this poetry, but also her poems are also printed in the publication as well too. So thank you, my name. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. What is your name, ma'am? My name. Yes, your name. My name is my name given to me by Guya. It is everything powerful and meaningful, embodying the strength from where I come. You won't find it in your white baby name books, but you stripped my name of its Hmong origins and robbed it of its significance when you colonized my name like you colonized my mind, the same way you twisted my tongue, just so it would make sense for yours. But you still confuse my two-part first name for a first and middle. I am a whole person. Stop reading only half of my name. My name is my people's way of life. It is a healer called upon to resuscitate. It is the belief in our ancestors' protection. It advocates harmony between our world and the spiritual. It is healing, protecting, and balancing, all rolled up into my name. My name rings like the Ju on Guya's fingers as he called home my soul for the 7th of October. My name sounds like Gunya's voice on a cold November night as she calls in a new year that brings abundant blessings. But my name sounds so crude and so dry coming from your anglicized, colonized, tone deaf tongue. Ma'am, I look up and respond. My name, that is my name. And then um, this next poem is called, My Language Belongs in My Mouth, Not in Their Hands. They cut my native tongue out from my mouth, threw it into the melting pot of this America and boiled it until I couldn't recognize it anymore. Now they've sold it back to me, but my native tongue feels like a stranger in its own home. Thank you very, my, uh, very much, my Ning. I just had shivers throughout. So I really appreciate your poetry. I actually heard you read one of the poetry at an event um, about anti-Asian uh, sentiments a few months ago. So I just really want to appreciate you uh, contributing to this panel as, as well too. Um, I want to thank the panelists for joining us. They are all people that I respect tremendously in our community. They are leaders, they're educators, um, and they have all experienced the educational system here in the United States. I was just reflecting that now the Hmong communities have been in this country for nearly 50 years. We are the second generation of people who have gone through the whole educational system. And I think this is the reason why we are so adamant about our language and our culture, because when our parents came, they were very busy trying to survive and to just work two or three jobs so that we can have this education. Now that we've been educated, we realize that we have lost so much, of, unfortunately. And so for those reasons, we have uh, been learning from our Native Americans and Native Hawaiian groups about how language reclamation is so important and that the, the life and liberty of our uh, future all depends on the knowledge that we have about our community. And so we have two rounds of questions that I will ask the panels. Uh, the first, the, to get started, I just want each of them to just introduce themselves very quickly to all of you. Um, and then I want to ask them what their reaction is to the paper because we've made them all read the paper as well too. So um, can I start with Kay, you first, um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and, you know, uh, in the context of language and education in, in the United States. And you can turn on your camera. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Kay Moa. Pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, I am the Leadership Programs Manager at the Coalition of Asian American Leaders, um, and my work is primarily working um, with young people, young organizers, and young leaders. Um, it is an honor to be here with all of you and to also um, talk about such an important topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and so the reason why it's so near and dear to my heart is that um, 
I, I grew up in St. Paul um, and have experienced the education system fully. Um, and as someone who, who also lost their language in that education system, I think um, refinding it again in the journey of, of reclaiming and coming home was something that was absolutely traumatic. Um, and when it happened, it was, I think felt like a huge part of my life that was missing that I refound. Um, and so when I was younger, I spoke a lot of Hmong English and then going to school, really um, being taught that that Hmong was unacceptable. Um, teachers telling us that it was exclusive when we spoke Hmong. So I often thought about how um, I felt so conflicted with the idea that Hmong was exclusive because when my mom speaks to us in our native tongue, like it was nothing but love and warmth. Mano Ma, like such a, a light and, and loving um, language, right? But being taught that it was exclusive and that it didn't welcome others. And so as a young person, I wanted to be friendly. I wanted to make friends. And so for me, like what that meant was like shutting the door to that language. Um, and then really not relearning that language until college, which was um, very ridiculous now that I look back. Um, so transitioning from high school to, to college um, for the first time, learning about Asian American history, taking among language class and really falling in love with the content, but also spending a lot of time in like shame, guilt and depression for for recognizing that I also didn't know who I was or who my people were. Um, and so it was ridiculous spending thousands of dollars to, to relearn my own language and history from a white institution, um, which was the same institution that told me that, that my language was exclusive. So I often think about um, the thousands of dollars that went into college, like that is the price that students pay when our education system fails us. And so like really feeling like that whole education system from K through 12 um, was a huge lie about who I was and who my people were. Um, and that there was an empty part of me that was lost for a long time. And really that relearning my language felt like coming home. So now primarily the work that I do is organizing with young people to make sure that that education system um, reflects us, works for us and actually honors like our whole being. Thank you, Kay. And I asked Kay to go first because uh, she was born in this country and um, she was the moderator for the, pa the youth panel uh, at our June 19th event uh, last year. And the paper is inspired by that youth panel. And so I wanted to just read one of the quotes that we have in the paper by one of the, uh, the panelists. She says, her name is Kia. She says, I deny my Hmong identity for a long time. I was embarrassed and ashamed to be Hmong. It took a toll on my event, mental health. It was more painful for me to unlearn and decolonize everything that I had learned. And so it resonates with what, uh, what Kay is talking about. And this is what our young people are going through. So it's not just about English language, but it's about our identity. It's about our culture, right? And it's about our, own, by, uh, our place in America. So next, I wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Bang at uh, uh, Osseo School District to say a few words because she has started a program there that has just been blooming and there's so many young people that now are successful because of that program. Bang. All right. Thank you, Kayeng. Um, um, I am Hmong American. I came to the United States with my parents at the age of four. I went through the St. Paul Public School System, graduated in 94, and throughout that whole 13 years of experience in the St. Paul public school system, what was missing was were the teachers of colors um, that I didn't have and also um, lacking learning about my own identity and heritage. And so in, um, when I got to high school, my mom was trying to learn how to read and write in Hmong and she's like, Peng, come to take this class with me at Lao Family. So we went to the community uh, center and learn how to read and write Hmong. And that's how my journey began with uh, my literacy with uh, in Hmong. And so fast forward, um, 
I became a teacher and then um, I've been teaching ESL uh, English uh, learners for about 19 years and then about four years ago um, with the successful um, program implementation of the Heritage Spanish course, the Hmong students and families were like, wait a minute, what about us? Why can't we have a Heritage Hmong program too? And so with, um, with the work of students leading the work and parents along with um, a community organization like Cal, they were able to put a program, have multiple meetings and put a program together for leadership at the um, at Park Center. And at the end of the journey, the four or five months journey, um, the EL teacher program coordinator um, said to me, you know what, Ping, let's write the course proposal and then the rest is history. We've been um working really hard for the last three years um with our Hmong one two and three uh courses we are going to be offering Hmong four this coming fall and then um two years ago i asked my um heritage vietnamese friends i said you know what what about you guys are you ready for this they're like yes and so they did not have to work um get all the community support and go through administration like what um, the Hmong families did, but because I already knew how to get the program going and how to write the proposals and everything, it was a lot easier for them. And so we will be offering a Heritage Vietnamese class to high school students. We have one class this coming fall. So they're excited about that. But our Hmong uh, heritage uh, program focuses on the heritage and language of the Hmong culture with the student center focus and through a social justice lens. So uh, all of that is super important to making sure that our Hmong students come out not only literate in um, the language, but also have a number of different um, assets that they take along with them. So thank you. Thank you. And Pang is not only a teacher, she's an advocate. And so she's very close to her students and families. And I think that it takes that, right? I mean, that's the, that's the point of having teachers of color and teachers who come from the community so that they really understand the depth and complexity of the community. Um, so moving on to another educator is uh, B. Vang. She's a parent and also an educator in the St. Paul School District. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so if you guys hear that, it's Biva versus Bivang, right? Uh, and I agree with um, Kay and my name that when we speak in Hmong, our language is so melodic. And I just feel like, uh, in some ways, I just feel like I'm, I'm so much smarter when I speak in Hmong, right? <laughs> but um, like Ayeng said, uh, I, I, am a, I am the current principal at Harding High School in St. Paul. Uh, in addition to that, I've been also the assistant principal at Phelan Lake Hmong Studies, uh, which is also a Hmong language program. Uh, and then I've also taught uh, for a few years at Jackson Elementary, uh, which also has a Hmong language program. In addition, um, as well as uh, I have a student who graduated from a, a Hmong Heritage Language Program or Hmong Dual Immersion Program uh, in St. Paul. And um, so basically I hope that I could be able to share uh, with you all today uh, my experience as an administrator, um, bringing that lens around programming, um, you know, how do we uh, start a program, how do we get it going, and how do we continue to support and sustain that program from that the aspect of uh, budgeting, prioritizing, um, as well as the lens of uh, a parent of a child, uh, you know, who went through a program, um, not uh, from a very uh, uh, young age, but, you know, from midway through her elementary years. So my daughter attended um, Jackson when she started second grade. And, um, you know, by that time, she was already uh, fluent in English. And actually by, by that time, English was her only language that she spoke. And um, she uh, basically did not pick up Hmong from her grandparents or great grandparents who were her caretakers at that time. Um, and so my husband and I 
uh, wanted her to be able to learn Hmong uh, in, a, in a setting where, uh, you know, she was going to be pushed uh, rigor rigorously uh, to learn the language. And it took her about three months um, after the first two months uh, or right about the first two months, every day she would come home and she would cry. And she would tell us that uh, she did not feel like she was uh, intelligent, that she did not want to take Hmong, um, that she couldn't communicate with anybody in her class. Her teachers refused to communicate with her in English and um, she was not willing to uh, continue. Uh, being the educator that I am, um, because my husband was ready to take her out. You know, at that two month time, he was like, we're, we're done. I told my husband, I said, you know, just give it, a, give us some time. Uh, you know, this is what happens uh, when we are uh, put into an environment where uh, our dominant language uh, is not spoken. And of course, my daughter, you know, at the time, her dominant language was English. Um, and so she stuck it out for another month. And after that third month, she started to blossom. She started to blossom in a way where um, we were, we, we couldn't take note, we did not take note of uh, prior to her going into that class. And uh, when she started reading in two languages, she, she, you know, she could read it in English and then she was starting to pick up Hmong, uh, not just uh, verbally and orally, but she, she was starting to become literate in Hmong. She developed a different uh, sense of pride in who she is, and um, an acceptance and a uh, you know of Kaying talks about identity and acceptance of her, her identity on a deeper level. And one thing that stuck to her to this day is the fact that she could communicate with our Hmong elders. And you know she specifically said that. If she didn't have that opportunity, she would not be able to communicate with those who did not speak English. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to this day, she is very proud of herself that she could have those kind of interactions with uh, folks in the community that does not speak um, English. And so from, from sharing these kind of stories or my experiences through my daughter's uh, growth uh, in her uh, dual uh, language program, I hope that we're going to be able to shed some light on how important uh, the support and the advocacy for heritage language is. Thank you very much, B. Um, one of the uh, students said that uh, at the panel, her name is Gay Kamui. She's Karen. She says it is very important to learn your heritage, language, and culture because it really helps you to connect and communicate with your grandparents who cannot speak English. Also, it helps keep the language, culture, and history alive. And we, and many of us, live in multi generational families. And so, can you imagine that elders and young people cannot even communicate together? I mean, we should be ashamed of that, right? And our education system should be worried about that. So. I want to uh, uh, transition to Dua Vu. She, is, she comes all the way from Fresno to us, and we went to visit a Hmong program in Fresno, and guess what? They were using books that were developed by our educators in St. Paul School District. So even though um, we are a pioneering community here in St. Paul, and I know that we're supporting uh, programs in, in California too, but uh, in Fresno as well too, but Fresno and the San Joaquin Valley is probably the largest Hmong population in the United States. And Dua has been a long time advocate there for uh, uh, heritage language reclamation. So please tell us your story very briefly. Uh, thank you, Kaying. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Kaying and Danika and the entire team for um, hosting this webinar and including me. Um, as part of this presentation, um, as um, you just heard, um, my name is Dua Vu and I am the manager overseeing our Hmong language program in Fresno Unified School District, which includes our elementary DLI program at two sites. Um, our first one was opened two years ago at Vang Pao Elementary, which is the only school that I believe is named after a Hmong person or a Hmong general um, from the Vietnam War era. And then this coming school year, we're very excited that we'll be adding our second site at Balderos Elementary. I also oversee um, uh, our Hmong Heritage Speakers courses, which is offered at all of our seven comprehensive high, school, um, high schools plus one specialty school. This is my 24th year in education as a longtime advocate for heritage language education. 
Um, I know that the, one of the prompt was uh, to also share about experience growing up as 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 a Hmong American. So I want to say a little bit that I I growing up I don't recall feeling like a Hmong American. Um, I think that. I don't think that this was even a concept for me until college, because in grade school, I was more closely connected to, to the Hmong community. Um, uh, Hmong was my native tongue. I ate Hmong food. I attended Hmong events. I was surrounded basically by Hmong people outside of school. So I don't really have that opportunity um, to, to have what you would call those that normal Hmong teenage uh, experience, um, American, I mean, American experience, because I was, I was, I was, raised in a very traditional Hmong home where I wasn't even allowed to participate in extracurricular activities. Um, and so, um, although I did have some non-Hmong friends in elementary schools, I began to hang out more with uh, Hmong peers starting in middle school all the way up to college. It wasn't until I was in college that I started getting more actively involved in the Hmong Student Association and taking Asian American studies, um, where I discovered more about my history, my culture, my language, where we came from, and our contributions to America. But I started feeling, um, I started to develop a sense of pride in being Hmong. So even though I grew up being very Hmong, I had that Hmongness in me, I didn't really have that Hmong pride. Um, and so in 2002, when um, the Fresno Bee published an article entitled Lost in America, which highlights, um, highlighted a string of teen suicides in Fresno County from 1992 to, uh, I mean, 1998 to 2002, where eight Hmong teens took their own lives and four of them died um, in the same year in, 2000, in 2001. This alarmed the community and uh, caught the attention of one state legislator, um, Assemblywoman Sarah Reyes, who came to a women's gathering um, that where we were organizing a, um, a camping fundraiser for the first person to be elected to the Fresno Unified School Board. She demonstrated genuine concern and wanted to hear the experiences of our group and wanted to know um, what we can share with her to help her do something at the state level that would help address this issue and, and help our community. So I basically share my experience growing up, as I just mentioned, about not seeing um, you know, my history, my people reflected in the mainstream textbook, um, not knowing that we came over here with so much contribution um, to the Americans as, as American allies and the secret war. And how sad it is that you know these students, and how heartbroken that these students take their own lives in high school, not even making it to college. Why do we have to wait until they get to college to learn about their history? It should be included in the high school curriculum, or even um, even lower in grade school. So, um, Assembly Woman Sarah's um, was touched by this, and she took this idea and she introduced it as as a bill in two thousand two. And it was passed into law, but because at that time, I think we were, um, California was facing a budget deficit, much like what we are probably facing, going to be facing right now with the pandemic. Um, so the bill was not passed uh, with a strong language like a mandate. It was an encouragement that the contributions of the Hmong people and the Southeast Asians um, be included in textbook in grades seven to 12. So that way money is, is not required to be allocated to states to develop the curriculum. So as you heard Kay Yang mentioned earlier, even though the bill was passed, I have not really seen this bill come into fruition. Um, in Fresno Unified itself, we've developed some curriculum to support this, but it, it's, it's really being just contained within Fresno. And not only that, in, in 1998, we had the passage of um, Proposition 227, which was the um, English only initiative. And that really impacted a lot of our, um, our bilingual program. Um, just to um, let you know, we had like about 25 schools in Fresno Unified at the time that actually uh, implemented the traditional bilingual programs. At that time, those were very popular. We actually did have one program too in the 1990s. And most of these programs actually got dismantled and we were down to like maybe five, a handful of them with um, the three DLI, which have 
survived up to this point. And so right now, um, I'm just very glad to learn and to know that the DI program, because it's been in, and the Spanish DI program has been in Fresno for so long. Now we don't have to look to data um, around the nation anymore. We have our own data in the system to support the benefits uh, of the program. And so we were able to um, replicate that program and, and grow our own, our own program. And so I'm really looking forward to really learning from, from my peers here about, again, how we can continue to expand heritage language education. Thank you, Joa. Um, I don't know how you, all of you sleep. I mean, you probably don't even sleep with the work, the amount of work that you do. Um, I want to just say uh, quickly that this is a really great segue into the reaction, your reaction to the paper, because studies after studies and personal testimonies, like all of you say that heritage language is important right, to the development of a young student, not only academically, but uh, individually as the uh, as a foundation for the identity and, and creating a strong sense of identity. Um, so the paper is really to just re-emphasize re re that, but we also know that in reality, we continue to fight for more resources and advocacy for uh, making sure that there's sustainable uh, support for these programs. So can, can I just do like a popcorn to see what your reaction is to the paper? Uh, how what, did it resonate with you? Is there anything missing in the paper and, you know, uh, and so forth. So maybe I can go back to Kay uh, to start with and we'll go around again. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I think I'm really grateful for this paper being published and then also just centering a lot of quotes around um, the young people who are really impacted. Um, so I deeply resonated with like essentially every line. Um, and that it really reflected true to my experiences and like all the emotions that I was going through growing up. Um, I want to share that the reality is that with or without papers and research that our um, experiences have always been valid um, and worth listening to and, and worth taking action on. Um, and that for hundreds and centuries like this, like uh, issues like these are things that um, communities of color have always fought for and advocated for. Um, and sometimes I wish we didn't need to take it this far for our, like that explains and breaks down our, our pain and trauma for, for us to be heard. Um, I think that as people doing this work, we always honor like our truth and speak truth to power. Um, however, I think that's not without a lot of pain and re-traumatization. Um, I think whenever we ask like, anyone to testify about why it, it's hurtful. I think that we're, we're asking our communities to revisit a lot of painful um, experiences in history. Um, essentially the essence of like language erasure has ultimately been really violent and traumatic to a lot of our communities that have experienced war and genocide and, and oppression. Um, and um, Sometimes I think speaking our own language has led to people being really violent to us in public. Um, and so that there's also a lot of fear in doing our, our advocacy work. We see the importance of it, but the reality is that, um, like when I was younger, I remember being at the store with my mom and having to translate with her, whereas the cashier was like acting as if she didn't exist um, just because my mom didn't speak English. And so I think about how our, the lives of our communities depend on this to be something that's more normalized. Otherwise, we will continue to be denied like services that are life and death. Um, we will continue to be um, assaulted for not speaking English in public. Um, and that that's still very real today. So that all of this has really real consequences. Um, but with that being said, I think I'm hopeful to see change and action come from this um, and that it's a really important step in the right direction. Great, thank you very much. Uh, how about Dua? Since you're all the way from California, I want to make sure you have a few words before we end uh, time. Okay. Well, I, I, I think that it's really well written, succinct and organized with the, you know, the introduction on here to education and why it matters, as well as the multilingual, the benefits of um, being a multilingual speaker and the policies that has affected or, or has brought about positive changes to the program and highlighting the different programs from um, various uh, districts and including the challenges. And I really appreciate that the student voices has been woven throughout the articles. Um, I know that we've also taken, um, taking um, 
student surveys at the end of our program each year. And, and so I, I hear the same thing coming from our students expressing mm -hmm. how appreciative um, the, the classes have been for them. Um, I, I appreciate the disaggregated data in terms of um, the, the, pro, the population growth and the Minnesota area. And I know that that's your focus. And I would like to see, um, I'm, and, may, and, and I'm not sure if maybe you already have this in mind already, but I would like to see um, more written on the Hmong DLI program in particular, because again, as the letter itself say, there's not enough research. And so just, you know, in our, um, in our data driven world that we're all living in and, you know, it's a part of our work, um, for us to continue to promote these programs, we need that data and just, knowing that the St. Paul programs have been in existence for so much more longer, mm -hmm. there's enough evidence at this point. And so I was hoping to really see that call out in this, um, in this article, but it wasn't. So I'm hoping that this is something that um, your group will take forward and, and, and highlight for us. And also I know that when I was passing this out and sharing it with folks that I know in California, the Sacramento group reached out to me and say, well, what's this? You know, how come our program is not being highlighted? So I was just thinking, I, and at the time, I didn't even realize that when you were visiting, it was going to be included in this paper. And so I was just like, oh, I don't know. They just came and visit. But you know what? I, I'm sure that you can still share your experience and share your stories and follow up letters. So, I mean, articles. So maybe that's something to consider the, the, as the, um, the Susan B. Anthony program. Again, they've been in ex existence longer than our program, too. So um, I just want to say that I really would appreciate having data showing again um, how well the Hmong students who are in the DLI program, because the research in general shows that, you know, in, in most of the other languages like Chinese or Korean or, or other languages that they, they do outperform students that are not in the DLI. So I would like to see that highlighted so that way we can continue to use that, those data to, to expand and grow more DLI program. And I, I'm just very um, impressed or very uh, appreciative that our Fresno Unified Board has really supported the Mondial Light program in Fresno. And in just two years, we were able to, um, to open our second site. I'm sure that, you know, it took a, a while before you were op able to open the second site in St. Paul. But right now, um, you know, again, with the budget so shortfalls that we're facing, we don't know how our programs might be effective, right? Mm -hmm. So the more data that we have available to us, the more to our advantage. Yeah. And this is only the beginning, right? And I know that all of you have been working to advocate for these programs for a long time. But like I said, we, at the end of the day, policymakers still need the data and the literature. And unfortunately, we do have to re-traumatize all of us so that we can have this paper. And so even getting this paper done was very challenging because uh, each of the program had very little written about themselves. So thank you for that, um, that recommendation because I think that that is the next step. For the interest of time, I wanted to see if B and I wanted to say a little bit about uh, what your experiences are uh, have been for advocating for heritage language reclamation because you guys have been uh, be especially have been in the St. Paul School District for the longest time uh, as an educator not particularly in heritage language but have been witnessing the program and what has it been like for you and what are the challenges because I think for the audience who don't know the Hmong community well we are in oral language based you know tradition and so for those reasons, we don't have written curriculums. We don't have uh, teachers uh, who have been trained to teach the language. So it is a few more steps before we can even create the programs. And once we create the program, we need the political will in the community to support it as well too. So it's a little bit challenging, but B, can you say a few words very briefly and then we'll go to yeah. audience question. Yes, I think, you know, Kayeng do uh, hit it on the head by saying data, like, the challenge is we have we don't have the kind of data that we need to really push and advocate for stronger financial supports right so that piece is, is so important when we can't really say how well our students are doing and we can say we know with formative data but we don't know with uh, uh anything more than formative data like we don't have research uh empirical data to support our claims. That's hard. These are claims that are hard to make. In addition to the curriculum piece, when we don't have a language that is widely uh, published, um, that is a challenge for us. I know that between uh, past school and my school and maybe even uh, some of the um, uh, schools in, in Sacramento, we're trying to, at the high school level, to get uh, Hmong to become an IB world language and even you know, the task of doing that is even hard enough um, mm -hmm. to really say, this is why we need Hmong to be an Ivy World language uh, uh, 
you know, course, because our students are interested in it and they deserve that recognition. But the pushback is, well, you know, what publication do you have out there? How many books, you know, uh, books written in Hmong for how many eras, uh, you know, and all of these things when folks don't understand that uh, we are a very young written language, right? And so without reports like this, uh, shedding the light and sharing with legislatures, uh, with, um, you know, district folks, different district level folks, the people who control the purse strings, it's going to be really hard for us to continue to, to uh, do this work on the ground, meaning the teachers who are teaching in these classes, working additional hours with very little uh, financial uh, support. Yeah, and I just want to say that in the, uh we do have a call to action as uh, one pagers that is part of the publication. And so uh, maybe in the chat, uh, I know we're running out of time, but for some of you, if you heard something that resonated with you and you want to act on it, maybe you can type down what you would like to do uh, to support heritage language, not only for Hmong, but there's Somali, there's um, Spanish, there's uh, Dakota, uh, Ojibwe, there are a lot of other languages in the state of Minnesota that need support, and we're highlighting the Hmong program today. Um, Fang, very quickly, what do you have to add to this? And then we'll, we'll entertain one or two questions from the audience. I would say that um, policies drive a lot of things, a lot of decisions that um, our district makes. And so with the LEAPS Act, the seal of biliteracy, it really helped um, um, our Spanish heritage Spanish program get started and then it was so much it made it made sense to make sure there was equity and so um, having the leaps act getting passed was key um, we also know that you know for less commonly taught languages it's not seen as a valuable language compared to French and Spanish and German and so this requires so much more uh, that students have to do, students, parents, and the community have to do, along with um, staff members as well, because oftentimes staff, as a staff, our voices aren't as important as those who are um, in the, from the community. Um, also, um, working in this in heritage um, language reclamation, uh, it is very, very um, difficult to work on in silos and we're all if we're all doing this work in silo it's very very challenging so if you we can get people to come together work together to collaborate our knowledge and resource etc we're really not working harder we are working so much smarter so thank you uh, I know we're out of time but can I just ask all of you to stay with us for another five more minutes we do have one question from the audience and then I also want to say I see Kate um, we we know that there's a MOOC program in Minneapolis as well too we know that with the district design in Minneapolis the OSIN is going to be a pathway to Patrick Henry and so I'm really pleased to see Minneapolis uh, leadership here on the call and we definitely need to work together on making sure that that is stable um, there was a question uh, Danica on the Q&A right do you want to yes one moment I am trying to find that question um because my screen is full oh, i thought i see here okay what will uh, what will support and empower young people from the community to go into education and become heritage language teachers or any discipline really what will support and empower young people from the community to go into education and become heritage language teachers or any discipline who wants to take that i'll, I'll take a shot at that you know uh, brad thank you for asking the question you know, I think that um, our students, our, our students are inspired. They do want to go into education, but to go into a heritage language uh, program that doesn't really have uh, any backings at the um, college level or the university level or a licensure to even call it their own is really hard, right? So again, uh, it is going to take all of us uh, to do this work to make sure that we um, connect to MDE, we connect to Pelsby, and we let them know that um, we need, uh, you know, uh, language teachers or uh, heritage language programs and licensures in our state, so that the teachers who are going into this track uh, can't have those credentials. Uh, oftentimes, we like Pa, we have to pull our EL ESL teachers to teach uh, in the Hmong language. 
And when they move out of that category, they're really not protected. And so, you know, when they're not protected, um, you know, because they're teaching outside of their licensure area, we have to apply for them. Um, we, we have to apply for a variance for them every year. And that makes it really hard uh, for many of our teachers in St. Paul, um, and I'm pretty sure uh, elsewhere too, but we need to work on getting um, the licensure programs uh, at these universities uh, and then recognized by PELSB so that our teachers can uh, have the necessary or the appro appropriate licensure. Bob, what are your thoughts? No, I was just going to add that every year I do a one lesson, 50 minutes, all about teaching. And I, I talk about teacher salary. I talk all about the challenges, all the great things and why I'm still teaching. And every year there's always one or two students that says, Miss Yang, you really changed me. I want to become a teacher. So I think it starts from seeing teachers who look like them talk mm -hmm. about the teaching profession from that perspective mm -hmm. and inspire them. Yeah. Yes, I'd also just like to add quickly um, that I hope that everyone who is on here today are connected to the young people in your lives, um, not just as mentors, but also just as peers and really seeing that they have a stake in this and that they really have um, really valuable lived experiences and opinions to share. Um, and I think oftentimes um, the root of this is also learning why not. So why don't we feel that young people are, are empowered or interested in going into the education field um, or anything really, right, is that they, they know the answers, they have the answers. A lot of times their lived experiences speak to those answers, right? Um, and I would just share that uh, as a person who works primarily with young people who organize and advocate in the system, that they're oftentimes met with the sentiment of that they're too young to have a voice or that their uh, experiences or opinions about what needs to change is invalid and that they're incompetent, right? And that's the system that's currently set up to support and uplift young people, right? So when you have young people who are in that system that already teach them that they're not um, capable or that their voices aren't valuable, it's hard for them to then go into that field, right? And as a lot of us have shared is that the education system has been pretty traumatic um, so then we're asking them to go back to fix mm -hmm. a system and a problem that wasn't created by them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just wanted to if, share. I can, if I can also just add that I think it also starts, it has to do with system-wide um, pipeline program where you're recruiting students already um, and you're making sure that you're recruiting students. Like for example, in Fresno Unified, we do have a program where, where we're already tapping into our high school students who are considering going into teaching um, and, and putting, putting them in programs. Like we have, we run summer school programs. Uh, so then they are actually already helping out in the summer school programs because during regular school, they're still in, 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 in class. So I, I, I really believe that this is important that we make sure we recruit in, um, students that reflect the demographics of our student population. Thank you so much. It's very challenging to bring everyone together, but when we're together, as you can see, we don't want to end. There's so much to share, so many stories to tell, and it's so empowering. And I'm so excited for, to have all of you here. Um, before I, I close, I wanted to ask my name to read one last poem, and then we'll before, thank everybody. Well, one more thing, before we close, um, I want to um, invite the, the uh, attendees to share um, in the chat, what is one thing you can do when you leave this session to support heritage language reclamation? Um, feel free, as uh, Mining is um, is reading her poem, to share your commitments in that chat, um, and we'd love to we'd love to take them and um, make sure that some of those may be included in some of our calls to action. Great, thank you, Mining. One last poll. Yes. Um, so actually, if I could also throw in kind of a shameless plug, um, the poems that I'm reading are from a book that I recently just published with her publisher um, called They Shift From My Lover to Yours. Um, and all the proceeds um, made from the book sales are going to a critical home studies um, program at UW-Eau Claire. So um, yeah. So this next poem that I will be reading is called Internalized Inferiority. 
I am still learning to love those parts of myself that I rejected 25 years ago. For though you cannot see the scars that 14 years of public schooling have left, I am reminded every day that I fight so hard so that one day, no Mo child will say to herself that she won't speak Mo at school, so her classmates will defend her. So no Mo child will believe that her culture and her people are unintelligent and undesirable. So no Mo child will be embarrassed to pack for lunch the food her mom cooks at home. So no Mo child will feel the burden of having to explain who the Hmong are and where we come from. So no Mo child will have to wonder where she goes to visit the homeland her parents talk so fondly of. So no Mo child will have to question whether she's Hmong enough or how she can be more Americanized to fit in. So that all Hmong children will feel valued in their skin and see that they too are worthy of love. Thank you all. Thank you, Maddie. Morning. Here's the book. Yes. Here you are. So you just know the cover when you see it. We will make sure this link is also um, posted in the chat and uh, mining if you can do that. We bought a, we bought a couple of copies. <laughs> <laughs> thank I you. just want to thank each of the panelists for your time and your wisdom shared with all of us today. I want to thank all of you who participated on this uh, call. I want to thank my partners at Education Evolving for being so patient with me and for really doing the majority of the work here. And of course, I want to thank all the contributors to the publication. Uh, we have a, a list of them on the slide, Danica. And then I want to thank the Bush Foundation for your generous uh, funding when we had our heritage event uh, in June and you continue our support in the learning journey that a few of us are part of. And Danika, you have the last word. Oh, let's see. So, and I'm actually going to be reading your words. Okay. Um, through heritage language reclamation, we have the collective power to shift the tides and reimagine student-centered and equitable education for all students. So thank you everyone. And thank you, Kaying, for your partnership. Alex, thank you for being a great co-author and we appreciate your time. Everyone take care. Thank you all so much. This was really, really exciting and, and just a wonderful culmination to a lot of work. And, and as all of you said, this is just the beginning. There's a lot more work to be done. This is just putting it down on a piece of paper, but we're, we've got a lot of work to do.